Well, there is often a divide separating the priorities of rural and urban communities, but many want to bridge that gap, which is why the ag industry is always at work to make their voice heard in Congress and, of course, across the country. Well, joining us now to speak on the importance of representing rural America on Capitol Hill is U.S. Senator Marsha Blackburn. Senator, thanks for sitting down with us once again. I'm we appreciate it. I'm delighted to be back in the studio and spend some time with you. Thank in you. your home state, of course. Of course. Now, yes. you often uh, focus on issues impacting rural America. Tell us about uh, time in agriculture and, of course, the value of being an advocate for the ag industry. Uh, the advantage or the good thing about being an advocate of the ag industry is you hear every single day mm -hmm. from those that are working in production agriculture. And they will talk a good bit about the issues that affect them, mm -hmm. the trade deals, the impact of tariffs, the concern about opioids, the desire mm -hmm. for broadband, high-speed internet, and the hopes that their neighbors and friends are going to adopt that internet service mm -hmm. when it comes down the road. Well, you've definitely kind of run through a list of issues that are common topics here on the Market Day Report right. each and every day. Uh, dive on into trade issues. Of course, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada sure. agreement is right there sitting on the burner. Where are we going to, where are we, what's going to happen, can we make it happen? We can make it happen. It has already been delivered to Congress. Mm -hmm. My hope is that the House will schedule that vote soon. We do believe if Speaker Pelosi will put it on the floor that there are the votes that will go ahead and push that through. We know it's going to get through the Senate. Mm -hmm. And we think if a floor vote is scheduled, it will get through the House also. Here is the thing about the USMCA. Whether someone is in agriculture or auto manufacturing or they're working on services in the financial industry, what they will tell us is this. This is going to create more jobs. It's going to give us more markets. It's going to give us free and fair trade. And let's get this on Mexico and Canada right there at the top of the list when it comes to our trading partners. They want the agreements and we want to see this agreement finished and signed. And on this note, I understand you recently traveled to the border. I did. What was the experience like? What it, tell us a little bit about that. I have that. to tell you, it was fantastic. I went out to, uh, to work with the Border Patrol mm -hmm. for a day and to see what was actually going on. I've been going to the border for about 10 years and working on issues that affect our Border Patrol. And God bless the Border Patrol and the ICE agents that are down there keeping our nation safe. Uh, the way people are walking across that border, raising their hands, saying asylum. They've been well coached. Uh, the cartels deal in two things, uh, trafficking human beings and trafficking drugs. I experienced both in about 30 minutes. We apprehended thir uh, 12 people, four from Honduras and eight from Cuba. Mm -hmm. And then in the port, uh, when we went over there, they intercepted one car that was loaded with no telling how much marijuana. Mm -hmm. Every side panel, quarter panel, back front, top bottom of that car packed full. And then there was another vehicle that had five kilos of fentanyl mm -hmm. in that car. And of course, these opioid um, analogs, the synthetics are on our streets. And for our local sheriff's departments and our police departments, uh, and for the families that are just so impacted by this, it is a heartbreaking situation. And I do want to talk to you more about the opioid crisis, but regarding uh, the, the USMCA agreement, what are you hearing from the ag community and what are you hearing from your fellow lawmakers? What I'm hearing from the ag community is let's get it. We want trade, not aid. Mm -hmm. We want open markets. And I was talking with someone this week uh, that is raising beef cattle and they were talking about the impact on cattle and the price that they were able to get. Same goes for pork uh, in Tennessee, east part of the state. Our dairy producers, uh, soy producers are very concerned not only about USMCA, but also about China and the trade agreement there. And they want to have it done. From lawmakers, what I'm hearing is uh, the votes are, are there in the House. Mm -hmm. Uh, the votes are there in the Senate. It's a matter of Democrat leadership in the House saying we're going to schedule it and bring it to the floor. 
And just one more note on that. We came across a story this morning they, that some folks think it might be doable by the August recess. By the August recess, yes. The mm -hmm. votes, we really feel like the votes are there. Mm -hmm. We think that if it gets scheduled, it will pass. What do you think as far as uh, moving forward and talking about the opioid epidemic? That's been uh, kind of a personal issue for you that you've really kind of taken a hold of. Yes. You know, for me, this uh, looking at addictive issues started um, years ago when I was a chairman of the board for the Middle Tennessee Board of the American Lung Association, and we were working on tobacco addiction mm -hmm. issues. I'm beginning to work through that in other healthcare boards, hospital boards that I served on in a vol volunteer capacity. And just then the drug issues that began to mount, I have to tell you, uh, when you talk with parents and they say, my child had to have wisdom teeth out or they had a sports injury and they sent them home with pills. I, one heartbreaking story for me as a mom who said, you know, we left the hospital. The son had an athletic injury. I left the hospital with an antibiotic and um, a painkiller, as she called it. And she didn't realize the addictive nature. And she said, I gave him every pill in that bottle of what, what was an opioid. And by the time I finished, he was craving more. Mm. And just the heartbreaking nature as you sit with these parents and you know, you just, I have picked this issue up because getting our arms around this to stop it, to make certain that there is money for recovery communities, to make certain that we are um, closing off some of these passageways that the cartels use to push their drugs in. It's why I'm so passionate about securing the southern border, and it's why I'm so passionate about getting these drugs off the street. Last week, I introduced the Ending the Fentanyl Crisis Bill, which will up the penalties on these drug traffickers and pushers that are forcing this into our communities. Where are we at? You just introduced it last week, so we right. still have it's a long way to, to go. It's going to the ju Judiciary Committee now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll certainly keep our eye on that. Yes. Uh, now, switching gears, of course, rural broadband. That's another subject oh, yes. we've talked about. And, yes. you know, everybody's got their fingers crossed that we can get that all across the country. Bring us up to date there as well. Yes. And we made tremendous strides. Last time I was here, we talked about the legislation I was introducing mm -hmm. with the access broadband and the precision agriculture bill and then the grants, the money into rural development for broadband ban grants. And it all went through. We were <laughs> successful on, on that. And what we are doing now is trying to continue to remove barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. We think this is important to do it now because 5G is coming into the marketplace. That is going to allow many of our communities with rural areas where you have that last mm -hmm. mile and you're trying to get that service, they're going to be able to do that wirelessly. It is also going to spur innovation for our farmers, for their equipment, as they are working through new applications that can be used for fertilization, uh, for watering, for some of the hydro processes that they use. We know this is going to be very helpful to them. We are also talking with entities uh, like senior centers and AARP and different organizations to encourage people to adopt the technology when it comes down their road and get those adoption rates up because you really can't have 21st century economic development or healthcare or education without access to high speed internet. So uh, the money, the grants are out there. Closing the digital divide is now a priority with the Federal Communications mm -hmm. Commission. It is a priority with the Senate Commerce Committee, and we feel good about where where we are with this. Progress is definitely being made. You brought up rural health care, and I want to kind yeah. of combine the two just like you did there. Uh, we've. There's always a lot of talk between getting the support that we need to get things passed that we need in rural America, but getting urban legislators to support those measures. Yeah. How can we get those votes 
to bring broadband to rural America, to bring rural health care, and bring support for those things that we so desperately need. You know, as I told a uh, colleague this week mm -hmm. who was from a, an urban area with a dense population, and uh, as I had questioned the FCC this week, wanting to make certain that our grants go to unserved mm -hmm not underserved, but unserved areas, which is rural America. I said, think about it like this. You all are the home to the big hospitals and the big corporations and things of that nature, but they are not going to have a healthy marketplace mm -hmm. all across this country if everyone does not have access to high-speed internet. I had a group in my office yesterday, much of their um, post-acute care, post-op care is now handled off an iPad. People go home, they pull their vitals, they send them in. Home health, much of that is now delivered over the internet with uh, checkups being done in home. And then seniors are not having to leave the home and have somebody take them an hour to a doctor's office for a checkup. Much of that can be done with them never leaving their house. That is the convenience and the access that people want to see. Any last words as far as uh, getting the support behind these measures to make them happen sooner than later? You know, your viewers need to make certain that they are contacting their members of Congress, both the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and saying, uh, keep the broadband broadband grants coming, mm -hmm. make sure they're for underserved, for unserved areas, and make certain that you get the USMCA passed this year mm -hmm. so that we can have certainty in our marketplaces. Do it before Congress recesses for August, and when you come back in the fall, finish up that China trade agreement. I like the th sound of that, and it certainly sounds like you're going to have a busy month between now and the August recess. We're ready for it. So any last words that you'd like to add? Oh, it's just a pleasure to join you, always. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with us. We certainly appreciate your time. Again, talking with Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn, joining us here in studio in Nashville, Tennessee, appreciating her insight.